Hey, everybody. Welcome to our seminar today on Paths to Net Zero. We're going to look at some insights, technology, and solutions. It's a part one of a four-part webinar series. And um, we'll, we'll go ahead and just let everyone get trickled in, and we'll go ahead and get kicked off. All right. So today's moderators, um, we're going to start off with myself. I'm a performance and innovation consultant here at Symmetry uh, with our Co-Innovation Lab. And um, my, my lead is Shivani Sony. She's our head of impact and innovation, and she oversees our Co-Innovation Lab and our global uh, strategy for our sustainability and technology implementation. All right. And let's go ahead and meet some of our panelists for today. Um, we have joining us Brandon Pietras. Um, he is a sustainability lead here in the U.S. for Fernheimer Architecture, and we'll learn more about him as well today. We also have Mark Whitehead, who is the construction director um, and the LCA lead uh, for CPAC Modular over in Ireland. And we also have Liam Bright, who is an architect and a sustainability coordinator in the U.K. at TP Bennett. So we'll get to know these gentlemen uh, very well throughout the day as Shivani and I kind of ask questions and get to know them a little better. All right, thank you for that, Luke. Okay, so before we dive into today's discussion, um, we'd like to give a brief overview of symmetry and our mission towards sustainability. So we can quickly get to the real stars of today, our panel and the audience as well. So at Symmetry, we're dedicated to driving sustainability in the industry. We focus on decarbonization through technology and expert consulting solutions, helping our customers to reduce their environmental footprint and meet their sustainability goals on projects. Our goal is to make a positive impact by leveraging our solutions and expertise to contribute to a more sustainable future. And there is not the reasons to find out why. It's not too hard to kind of see it. We focus heavily on this because climate change is causing a widespread negative global impact. With more frequent heat waves, droughts, wildfires, and storms, these extreme weather events uh, affect our communities, ecosystems, and our food security as well. And they're leading to biodiversity loss and forcing people to actually relocate due to the rising sea levels. And for all of us working in the built environment, these challenges directly impact how we plan, design, and how we build as well. The urgency is clear. Action is needed now. And when we look at the construction industry, well, the construction industry plays a huge role in the global carbon emission and the resource consumption. Sustainable construction is about minimizing this environmental impact by using recycled materials, energy efficient methods, and reducing waste. We can lower our mission and create better outcomes for projects. And it's also too important to address that embodied carbon is about 11% of the global emission tied to materials and building processes. We know that the journey is not straightforward. There is many paths to kind of get there as well. But the key thing is to start and to act on small little things, but to start moving the needle together. And that is reflected in our actions as well. Through our collaboration with partners such as Autodesk and OneClick LCA, we are bringing and working towards meaningful change in the industry. One of our key initiatives is Navi at Zero, which is powered by OneClick LCA, enabling users to assess carbon impact in the early design process. It's trying to take a proactive a way to data-driven approach to reduce emissions right from the beginning. And then we also have our co-innovation lab, which is the driving force behind today's presentation and the series upcoming as well. But it's focused on transparency and collaboration and innovation, all of the values that are essential for effective decarbonization. Our goal is to provide a sustainable solution that truly makes a difference within the built environment. But I'll hand it back to Luke now if he just gives us a little overview first. Absolutely. So let's go ahead and divine and, uh, define and understand kind of the overarching uh, topics for today. First off, we're going to talk about how sustainability becomes business imperative. So over the last few years, uh, I think we kind of all have seen the invested, uh, investor demands, the risk, the reputation 
um, all the government regulations that are coming out and all the reporting frameworks that we kind of have to adhere to. Um, these are all being kind of created to really create opportunities for us as organizations to prioritize these sustainability initiatives. So to establish these goals for really driving decarbonization, um, investors are really looking at ESG credentials, right? So we all are familiar with ESG, environment, social governance, right? So consumers are favoring sustainable brands and companies that are truly committed and not just greenwashing. Um, so employees and shareholders, we're all pushing for really stronger commitments and more engagement, right? So um, we all seen how government regulations are also increasing, requiring the transparency in, um, in our reporting and how we practice um, in the environmental and the social practices of our projects. But really to put this all simply, sustainability is now key to really long-term business success, right? You think of anything being sustainable, it's going over longevity, right? So let's go break that down. What does sustainability really mean to us as an industry? So when we say sustainability, that means making choices that benefit us today without really compromising the well-being of future generations, right? So it has nothing to do even with being green. You can be sustainable in business because you want to be in business in 20 years from now, right? So this includes reducing you know, pollution as well. On top of that, protecting biodiversity, fighting climate change, you know, ensuring you'll have customers in 20 years, right? Um, and really providing a good quality of life for all, you know, your community, your organization, the people within your organization, and the people you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So for businesses, this means making your responsible choices that really support both profit and planet, right? Um, and so sustainability is a global issue, but it's really going to require us to come together and put in local solutions really to tackle these really unique challenges that we're kind of facing today, right? So. Uh, what does decarbonization mean, right? So if we, we understand what sustainability means, now we're talking about decarbonization. And well, really decarbonization is just about reducing your carbon emissions and it's going to help fight the climate change. Um, so this means we're going to be trying to hopefully switch to renewable energy like solar, wind, whatever is more advantageous in your climate zone or where you live. Um, but we're going to use more more energy, just more efficiently, right? We're not going to have as much energy lost through windows. We're going to have better envelopes. Um, and we want to capture carbon emissions wherever possible. So, um, you know, if you can recycle steel versus cutting down a tree that's been growing for 70 years, let's, let's think about what those decisions mean. Um, so small changes really in your daily life really are going to make a big difference, you know, um, as the masses, you know, small, small drops in the bucket can really equal a lot. You know, everyone likes to talk about Taylor Swift flying her private jet and all that. But we can really do much more impact than that by just doing small, small reductions and living more sustainably. So after we get done talking about sustainability and then we went into what decarbonization is, the next step is this is really what is net zero, right? So sustainability is kind of like the overarching topic and decarbonization is like our, our goal is to decarbonization, uh, do decarbonization right? Net zero is like our strategy, our goal to get there, you know? So with net zero, it means balancing both our greenhouse gases that we produce within the project. And as we remove them from the atmosphere, it really involves uh, cutting emissions across, you know, the way we transport materials through our industry um, to how we build um, and the energy we use in the building while it's running. So we're also increasing efforts like reforest uh, reforestation, carbon capture, um, you know, to kind of offset some of those things as well. So achieving net zero is critical for really stabilizing this climate. And it's also going to help offset what you take, you know, you put back what you take in. And it's going to require collaboration across all sectors to really ensure that we're doing this correctly and sustainably in the future. So how do we do that? We do that with life cycle assessment, right? And so all those key terms we have, they all provide into a life cycle assessment. This is the way we measure it, right? So LCA looks at environmental impacts of a product or the process of that product from start to finish. Um, though this means we examine every stage from how the raw material was either extracted from the forest, mined from the ground, um, how it's put together and constructed, transported to the site, energy it uses during the occupation of the building, and then what happens at the end of life. 
are we going to reuse this beam um, or are we going to melt, melt it and make a new product out of it? Or does it just, you know, are we going to stay the frame and we put a new skin on the building? We can really understand how those decisions impact the building and where we can start reducing our carbon um, emissions and making a better, um, better overall impact on our project. So we'll go ahead and get into some more of the panel discussions here. All right. Thank you for that, Luke. All right. So there's so many key terms out there, right? Luke just gave an overview of sustainability, decarbonization, net zero, and LCA. And we can all kind of think of ideas of, all right, what does that mean when we just need to put that into practice? But sometimes we need to kind of strip this back and actually see what does that mean for us as an organization to actually achieve that? And how does that work when it comes to us working towards our projects as well? So if we look at connecting these ideas, let's start with the central idea of sustainability. This is our guiding vision. It's aiming to harmonize the economy, social, and environmental factors for a better future, as Luke kind of touched on as well. And within this vision, we have the strategy, the strategy of decarbonization. In the built environment, this means reducing your carbon emission by enhancing energy efficiency with low carbon energy sources and minimizing the carbon footprint of our infrastructure. But then we have, and we encounter net zero. This can represent the balance that we aim for, offsetting our carbon emission with our efforts to remove carbon and generate clean energy on our projects. And our goal is to achieve, uh, to achieve this balance. And finally, we have LCA. In the built environment, LCA measures the environmental impact of constructions, materials, and building operations as well, and infrastructure projects projects. And altogether, it provides us a data-driven insights for making sustainable decisions and making them to be impactful as well. So with that being in mind, as we discuss the critical role of sustainability in shaping organizational strategies, I'd like to invite and explore our panelists today on how does, the com how does your company's sustainability vision influence your work? Could you share some of how this vision actually guides your approach and how does it help you towards your project? What steps are you actually taking to align with it? Maybe we can start with Brendan. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Shivani. Um, so it's it's a really impacted that we work in pretty fundamental ways. Um, I think the, the first is that sustainability and especially embodied carbon versus operationals becoming a much more critical part of um, our conversations with the client and our consultants and even with the GCs very, very early in the project. Um, so this is in like concept and even sometimes during like when they're actually bidding for a project and it'll come up as part of like what our internal objectives are and something that we're going to be basically placing on the project in some capacity, whether or not it's necessarily what the client was thinking of as one of their primary objectives as well. Um, so that we can ensure that our own kind of internal backstops on um, quality of materials, um, the types of assemblies we're working with and the total embodied carbon of the project are maintained. Um, but what this really comes down to is kind of presenting them with like a framework um, that we adapt to every project. Um, we have like a standard template that we then kind of adapt depending on the scale or the typology of the building um, that helps guide these discussions and creates a document that we can all share and refer back to in later project phases so that we have like a shared vision um, and a series of goals that we that we can always kind of um, look back on if things get distracted or, or chaotic later in the project. Um, we've also started to adjust a little bit of our project structure. So instead of just having like a single project manager on a project um, who's interfacing with the client, um, people like me are now more specialized in talking about embodied carbon, global warming potential, and like what sustainability means for the company, um, and having us interface with multiple projects at a time so that we can make sure that the standards that we're setting are applied equally across all of our initiatives. So is that like taking, if I'm, if I'm hearing this right as well, as, as Bernheimer architects, there's a, there's a framework that you're working towards, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah. you're trying to make this as business as usual. So you're taking some of those aspects and you're actually trying to encourage to work with other stakeholders to make it as business as usual as well and adopt some of those principles. 
Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, and I think some of the later questions will address this more specifically. Um, but something that we're doing internally, for example, is basically auditing all of our finished schedules for all of our projects and the specifications that have been included to start to identify some of the hot spots where carbon is sneaking its way into projects um, or where um, aspects of like sourcing or the supply chain um, are blind spots to us and how things get substituted or actually put into the building later on. So once we're able to kind of address those internally, um, we can start to set our own standards and it just becomes a baseline for us moving forward. And it doesn't even have to be a discussion with the client. It's just something that we and the developers that we work with regularly, um, we often have repeat clients and repeat um, um, builders as well. Um, it becomes standard practice for them and it becomes just a much more easier process and not something we have to fight through um, in later stages. All right, thank you. And, and what about, Liam, what about for TP Bennett? Yeah, so we've we've been kind of auditing similar to uh, Brandon have kind of looking at all of our projects we're over 400 strong um with countless projects over the years and we've kind of highlighted that historically we've been unconsciously unsustainable um we've then moved into consciously unsustainable and we're we're now we can we can say with some confidence that we are consciously sustainable as much as we can be um with the ultimate goal to become unconsciously sustainable so it needs to be embedded in everything we do um architecture in general is something that people spend their lives doing they have skills and knowledge and habits that they bring with them even through from some people who are not me thankfully but some people who had uh, gone from drafting by hand to now using software such as revit and bim protocols uh it's different software, but it's the same way of working. It's the same way of procuring, working with contractors, working with consultants. And what we're kind of doing in the, uh, the sustainability team is disrupting that. We're saying, you're not wrong, but you can do it differently. Um, so we've been investigating every workflow that we have, every element that we're designing, the way we're working, and basically changing the way we work uh, bit by bit. Uh, we can't change everyone overnight um, so we're producing guidance we're using software um, we're producing our own small bits of software just to fill in a few gaps um, and that hope is that over the years as these things develop people use these things similar to what brandon said going through and looking at how we can change this working with stakeholders it becomes something that is unconscious so we can go from that consciously sustainable to unconscious sustainability I like that. I like, um, there's a line that I always say as well is everyone is right and everyone is wrong at the same time. And I feel just a little bit that you were kind of explaining there is saying, yeah, we're not saying it's, you know, perfect or anything like that. But we could do something. And it's not saying you're wrong, but we could maybe kind of look at it from a different lens as well, right? Yeah. I always try and approach it with the thought that um, you don't know what you don't know. So, um, where people may be being con consciously sustainable in certain areas might not know that there are alternatives or different ways of approaching things um, because they've never experienced it, they've never seen it. So we're, we're trying to offer that up to people um, through lectures, through presentations, by sitting down with them as well. Um, and suddenly they go, oh, I've never thought of doing it that way. I didn't know that existed. Um, and then when they know, they can't be consciously unsustainable anymore. They have to, they know about it. Um, so that's kind of what we're weeding out at the moment. Um, and we're pushing forward to get better results as well. And what about Mark? What about with CPAC? Hi, Shavana. Yeah, I suppose we're a little bit different from uh, Liam and Brandon because obviously we're a, a, a modular main contractor, but we've also got an in-house design team. So kind of we take it from start to finish the project from concept right through to handover so i suppose that gives us uh, we've seen it as a massive opportunity because obviously we're in control of every stage uh all of our productions done in-house the designs done in-house so it's an excellent opportunity for us to kind of look at how sustainable we are and uh but you can imagine it, it throws up a lot of issues a lot of challenges as liam and brandon have said kind of you know it's, it's a very difficult thing to do but luckily we've got a very innovative team here who are coming on board and you know pushing it forward and obviously a big thing for us is it's mandates that are going to be coming into Ireland that you know from Jan 25 I think it is it's a, a you know 20 million plus contracts have got to have the, the LCA you know you've got to show that it's going to be part of tenders it's going to be part of the projects going forward so you know 
don't know what the exact mandate is, but I'm sure in three or four years' time, it's going to be down to projects under a million. So then, you know, that's that's where we've got to move with the times and we've got to kind of lead the market, I suppose, and try and push our sustainable goals. And, you know, our vision is to, you know, be able to produce these uh, modular buildings, uh, you know, from start to finish and offer the full solution. Sure. And would you say that um, the mandates that are upcoming, that are looming, it is your driving force in the sense that, you know, to be in the forefront before we, instead of being reactive, we're trying to be proactive onto that approach to drive sustainability on all of our projects going forward? Well, it's a couple of things, Shivani. So kind of, yeah, the mandates are definitely, you know, pressing in the back of the mind, but it's also the fact that, you know, the work that we've done with you guys there a few months ago, you know, it opens everybody's eyes within the company, within the clients of what we could achieve by doing things slightly differently. And, you know, but the biggest obstacle that we come across is always, you know, the cost side of it. You know, we want to be sustainable and everything, but oh, if it costs more, then, oh, well, we're not too sure. And this is kind of where we've got to try and break that stigma and, you know, look at the long-term benefits as opposed to that kind of short-term 5% saving compared to the long-term. So, you know, that's what we're trying to get across. But, you know, ultimately, sometimes these tenders that we go for come down to lowest lowest price wins. So, you know, unfortunately, that's got to change as well within the, the whole kind of tender process. Yeah, it's always trying to find that um, fine balance between uh, sustainability and cost, right? And it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, the new sort of phrase, I don't know if it's a new phrase, but it's looking at sustainability as a currency now to get people yeah. to kind of act on it, to understand what is that kind of carbon impact. What I liked of what I was hearing that is kind of similar between all three of you is, you know what, we're driving a change. We're driving a to get people to think slightly differently. And it's like one step at a time, but that one step at a time, then hopefully we're going to come together to actually make that business as usual as we start kind of moving forward. But we've got to start start somewhere into that as well. I'm really interested to hear you guys' thoughts on this. Uh, I think we all agree decarbonization, I guess we would say, is, is essential really for kind of driving our sustainability within the A&E environment, right? Um, and every every project kind of offers unique opportunities. Um, I don't think any projects kind of rinse and repeat um, for the most part. So I would really kind of just, I want to hear more about your top strategies that you prioritize to really achieve uh, achieve this decarbonization strategies because you know we all have prescriptive methods and then you may learn something new with your analysis but you know what 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 are you using what analysis are there so whether it's like energy efficiency or sustainable material selection or you know what innovative design approaches are you guys taking that's been most um, impactful on your guys's journey. Um, and I guess since we started with Brennan last time, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and I'll start with the construction side with Mark, and then we'll work our way backwards just to kind of mix it up a little bit. Cheers, Luke. Thank you. Uh, look, we, I, I'm not going to go on about every single thing we do on this because obviously there's huge amounts. I'm sure Liam and Brennan will, will agree, kind of, you know, we could talk about this for, for hours kind of thing. So, you know, one thing that we're looking at doing is we're looking at how we kind of, you know, design for disassembly and reuse you know, building that into the project, into the life cycle analysis there. So obviously, you know, that's a, a huge uh, benefit for everybody. But I think the other thing that we do, which is kind of a little bit different, I suppose, because we're an off-site, constru- you know, manufacturer as well, is the, the, the lean side of stuff. So, you know, I, everything that we do, we try and do it lean. So one thing we've done is we've invest, invested heavily in uh, training for, for lean. So with um, 112 white belts in our company, with 20 yellow belts, with 19 green belts, and with one black belt. Okay, so but what that does is ultimately lean is all about reducing waste. So whether that's, you know, materials, whether it's uh, labor, whatever it is. And I know it's kind of a little bit left field of what we're talking about slightly, but, you know, it's still a massive impact because I know that Liam and Brennan probably will talk about material choice, etc. because, you know, that's a significant one. So, you know, but one thing that we have noticed that has changed our way of producing and kind of being able to get that kind of waste down, etc., and look at the full thing is the, the the lean manufacturing that we've been kind of bringing into our uh, into our facility. Excellent. And we can we've seen the impacts of that, correct, with yep. just how much you've been able to save with just doing some prefab and modular design and having that stuff come to site ready to be assembled. So uh, hopefully yeah. we can we'll show the audience more on that stuff a little bit later and show them how impactful that was. Um yep. I guess Liam, you kind of seen something similar to Mark is um your or you know what are what are your key drivers here? Yeah, I think in terms of decarbonization, there's there's only one thing realistically, uh, without going into too much detail, which is early, 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 early. 
as early as you can start talking about it start understanding it um we there's a fantastic graph uh that we were looking at when we we had um someone come in to talk about their low carbon products and that was kind of the amount of options you have and changes you can make at the start of a project are incredibly high and the costs are negligible you haven't actually got a project yet so you can make as many changes you want as the stages go they switch so that you can barely make any changes and any ones that you do are very expensive so when i see people um at stage three or stage four in terms of the rba plan of work here in the uk um so just before construction and they're talking about oh let's look for low carbon materials you've already gone through planning you can't change the building you've already made a decision you've got the qs signed off on everything and the cost and you now want to talk about a clt structure structure engineers are, they're going to throw a brick through your window because that's absolutely not going to happen so you want it early you want to get some numbers even if they're napkin maths numbers comparing steel to concrete to hybrid Get that in, work out your building form, start going with low carbon materials, work out the details later. Perfect is the enemy of good. Just start doing it, look at some numbers and get going as early as possible. Um, clients don't like to bring in um, consultants, so structure an MEP too early because they kind of don't really have anything to do. There's no building for them yet. But having someone just to consult and talk through the numbers, verify whether the options that you're going are working can really, really help in achieving way higher than we already are um potentially towards net zero no that's fantastic and that that's been a successful strategy i've seen with other other firms as well is just yeah. engaging with your engineers early on so they're planning a more sustainable system rather than starting projects in sd or stage two which yeah. are you know run the mill right so they're it's, prepared for that it's also a conversation with the client as, as Brandon mentioned yeah. before, it's, it's getting them on board and saying, you need to do this now. I know you're doing the LCA at stage three. That doesn't mean you start it and think about it then. You have to do everything mm -hmm. before before that becomes your kind of validation tool. Well, you're right. And as designers and architects, you're kind of the educator, right? You're kind of leading the client, like why it's important. And, oh, we can also save you money too. Well, thank you. Fantastic points. Um, Brandon, do uh, you have any other uh, points to add on to this or any other strategies yeah. that perhaps we can yeah, sure. So, and I know exactly that graph that you're talking about. <laughs> We've seen that a lot and used it in a lot of our presentations as well. Um, so I, I don't think I could add much more specifically to like the basic strategies than Liam and Mark have. I think that's exactly the same as, as we approach things here too. Um, I already mentioned, you know, just our kind of internal auditing of all of the materials that we specify, um, specification being one of the greatest powers and of the architect and the places where we can run into the most trouble. Um, but Bernheim is a little bit different than a lot of other practices because most of our business comes from affordable multifamily housing. Um, so the way that we work is often with, as I mentioned earlier, developers, um, contractors, um, and owners who are doing, you know, many of these buildings at really large scales. And they've been doing the same type of thing for years, if not decades. Um, and the industry has really kind of codified um, a way of working and a way of building and especially a uh, material language that's very specific to affordable housing um, and can be very difficult to kind of push against. So um, when Liam says that, you know, having these conversations really early with the client and trying to make the biggest changes early, what that means for us now is kind of trying to really rethink what affordable housing looks like fundamentally. Like what are the aesthetics of that building typology? Um, because for the most part right now, it's brick <laughs> or it's like aluminum metal panel, right? That's pretty much like the two, if you think about affordable housing, that's the two material types people think of. And both of those are really, really high embodied carbon materials. Um, there are some options within clay masonry that you can do to lower that, but largely speaking, you have to think about different material types um, and ways of constructing the envelope, especially as we're forced towards higher and higher performance envelope and rain screen systems in the first place. Um, so we're really trying to fundamentally rethink the types of cladding, the types of finishes, and even sometimes the, the form within the kind of um, limits that we have in New York City, um, zoning code and, and, and all those other limitations, um, how we can kind of change the way people think of what affordable housing looks like and what leeway that gives us. Um, and the second is to just start pushing decarbonization and our objectives as part of our marketing strategy. Um, and as part of the kind of base materials that we include in all of our project proposals and even in competitions and RFPs. So it becomes um, 
almost like a branding effort or a marketing effort for the firm um, that helps position us in a better position to then kind of maintain um, those priorities throughout a project if we were to win those competitions or RFPs um, and just kind of place pressure on all the other um, members of the team and of ownership and all that to kind of work with us in that direction. Well, that's excellent. No, that, and that's the perfect, perfect answer. You guys covered it great. So no, I really appreciate that. And I think it's good to kind of understand how we are going to approach this. So everyone can kind of, you know, I always, I always use this term slow motion is better than no motion. And, you know, maybe if there's any, you know, hip hop fans out there from the early 2000s, they'll get the reference, but, um, you know, you got to just kind of take that leap of faith off the edge, do something. It's better than nothing. And, you know, instead of waiting around for everything to catch up, you guys are the innovators. And Brandon, I know you actually especially have a harder pull sometimes with working with the developers where the large scale projects, maybe sustainability is not on their mind. So baking it into the project as business as usual is a, a very sneaky, good way to get your, get your stuff done. All right. Thank you for that. All right, so as we move forward um, towards a more sustainable future, achieving net zero is a key goal for many organizations, right? And I'd like to hear about your efforts in this area. Like, how are you working towards net zero in your projects? What are some of the challenges that you're facing and addressing along the way as well? And maybe this time, maybe we'll start with Liam. Yes, so net zero is something that, we're starting to target more. Um, it's not on every project. Uh, we're trying to convince more clients go towards it. The issue we're having with that and with actually achieving it is there isn't really an answer. Um, kind of Brandon touched on it briefly in terms of there's a there's a way of working. Um, there's a typical design. And honestly, you mentioning brick is giving me flashbacks. To basically, every project I've ever worked on here in the UK, we're obsessed with brick here. Um, but the issue is, is that there's also the kind of wall buildups that we have. We've recently had the Building Safety Act come through. So fire safety is a massive, massive contentious issue here. And we're struggling to find sustainable materials, especially for um, facades and kind of structural buildups that are meeting the new regulations. They're not tested in certain systems. Um, they are more expensive as well. And that balancing of needing to meet, well, having to meet regulations, but that wants to be more sustainable is something that is a battle that we can't win uh, at the moment. So the hope is that now that all of that's out there, we know what the regulations are, we know what tests need to have. We're speaking to a lot more suppliers um, and contractors about basically verifying the different buildups and materials so that we have a bigger pool to choose from. Because that's, for me at the moment, that's the biggest issue is, is finding ones that are viable um, that are relatively cheap and that are tested and will work. So it's it's a bit difficult. And um, yeah, trying to convince them to say net zero, but then not having a clear strategy of how to get there is is one of the biggest hurdles. Um, but we are we're seeing more pop up every day, which is good. I think um, that's a very common thing that I personally hear as well. It's like yeah, we're hearing this 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 sort of guiding style. We should like kind of meet towards these net zero kind of goals. Still, I guess some are still trying to define what that actually means, right? And what it actually means for the organization. But then you have the other side of the flip um, point, I guess, right? Is the data out there. There's not enough data out there. So to kind of challenge that is almost like you've got to start talking to that supply chain. You've got to start educating them on that. And to just to get at least some of the information to become that starting point once again to go, all right, now we can start to see some of those insights. And then maybe as we start to build that data up more and more, those sort of net zero goals that we actually set out will become a little bit more easier to understand because we can start to see that insight. We can start to see that impact kind of moving forward as well. But it is a, a very common thing, right, is trying to build up that database. Yes. Yeah. Um, Brendan, what about yourself? Yeah, data is data's a big one. Um, so right now, one of our biggest challenges is just disclosure in the first place. Um, you know, there's all, we've been specifying with chose for a long time that really just don't have the information available as to what their embodied carbon content is because it wasn't a concern with a lot of manufacturers for a very long time. So we're trying to put a lot of pressure now on our manufacturers and our reps to provide us with that information 
if they don't have it to start thinking about investing into um, performing EPDs for the products that we specify. In a lot of cases, um, you know, it hasn't been fully successful yet, but we have had positive feedback from them because they're often specifying really, really high volumes of the projects uh, or of the products that we're specifying, like tile, for example. Um, if it's in like a 300 unit building, that's a lot of tile. It really incentivizes them. If we're going to purchase it from them to actually, you know, work to get the information that we need. Um, another challenge though, for us, we're a relatively small firm. We only have about 20 employees, give or take, depending on, on the project cycle. Um, so finding the, just the man hours that we can commit to the research and the kind of, um, LCA building and, and modeling that it takes to actually find out where we stand and establish baselines for ourselves to measure against is quite difficult. Um, luckily there are through, we're in New York state, there are, um, some grants and, and financial incentives, um, that we can apply for now that allow us to get some funding to kind of defray those costs, which we're, which we're pursuing all the time. So that's helpful. Um, but always the kind of time and effort relative to the project fee, um, especially if it's not something that's a, a, a prime concern of the clients can be, can be quite a challenge. Um, and lastly, I would say that we're simply because of the building typology and the city and fire code here in New York as well. Um, concrete is our biggest challenge, um, reducing volume first and foremost, which you often just can't do, um, within certain parameters, foundations here are concrete. Um, for the most part, our buildings are being ca uh, built out of cast in place or block and plank. Um, so there's a lot of, uh, poured concrete, um, or grout and fill and CMU block. Um, and we have worked with a lot of, uh, manufacturers and cement mixers here, um, that are starting to integrate things like ground glass poslins um, and carbon cure into both their block and their cast in place mixes, which is helpful. Um, but there are implications for some of those on things like project schedule, where if you don't address it early enough, um, it can become a stumbling block and can end up messing up your specifications later. And the carbon comes back into the project. Um, we've had, especially with the cast in place, even the couple of days um, that, you know, a high mixture of ground glass poslin might add to the curing time can have a huge implication on cost and time for a cast in place building that's 15 stories. Um, so if you don't anticipate that stuff early on and kind of really get the structural engineer and the client on board with that, um, you can be kind of SOL, um, so to speak, on on the mixes that you're being um, supplied during like, the bidding process and during um, submittals. It's that um, same old thing, isn't it, about um, project life cycle, time, resources, and mm -hmm. Now you're kind of adding another layer on top to kind of say, no, we've got to make sustainability a reality, but you actually need to carve that out into the project and go, actually, we've got to have X amount of time, X amount of resources. And we, like how you've all been speaking as well, speak about it as early as possible. And often, unfortunately, I, 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 I would like to think we're slowly pivoting. Sustainability is still that last thing that people are kind of talking about to bring it as business as usual, put it into that sort of contract. But I think, again, the way that you guys are approaching it to go, actually, we're going to put it in our RFPs, we are going to put it in our contracts and stuff. It helps to start making that change um, to at least start thinking about it, but still getting that fine balance is uh, the same old sort of issue that we have, but hopefully we can start kind of pivoting it going forward. Um, okay. I'd like yeah, sorry. Real quick, just to clarify one thing as well, um, is that we have uh, everyone that we work with is kind of really they talk about sustainability a lot and they're really into it. But for the most part, that means operational for them. So we're really talking about super high performance envelopes, um, yeah. really, really high performance heating and cooling systems. But the knock on effects of that are often that they're not really thinking about the embodied carbon and what it means to really seal up buildings like that, add all that extra insulation and all that. So it can sometimes be detrimental in some ways that aren't expected as well. Yeah. Um, I'd like to just with time. I'd like to uh, bring on Mark as well, because from your perspective, it's probably <coughs> slightly different, right? Yeah, yeah. But was same challenges material wise is is the biggest challenge that we have. Kind of, if we change a material in our system, we've got to fire test it. We've got to go acoustic test it. It's a huge amount of money. It's a huge amount of time. So finding the right products is very difficult. And like you say, as there's not much information out there about them, kind of to kind of give you that guiding backup, it's very difficult to to change our system for a new material to try and make it more you know sustainable or get to this net zero because it's, it's it's so so much input from our side for you know financially and time to to bring a new product into our system so um you know the the data side of it is very uh, very very much a problem for us as well as far as the, there's not enough of it out there so uh, 
you know, we, we're doing the softer stuff, obviously, you know, the transport, et cetera, because we're offsite, there's less transport, you know, et cetera, for materials and things. So that's all the soft stuff we're doing. But obviously, you know, that's 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 the easy stuff we're wanting to try and push. So we are going to push forward and, you know, start introducing some more sustainable materials, some more, you know, uh, into our systems in, in order to try and achieve this. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a bit of a risk, but, you know, something that we're going to have to do to try and, you know, create that data as well as self. I think um, to one extent as well is that because you're kind of driving it as kind of CPAC, it allows you to, uh, like I'd like to say, like get the polite whip out as well, right? Mm. To try to get some of that information, still trying to define that information, trying to understand what sort of information and having that sort of knock on effect, I'm I'm sure is a challenge, right? Um, yeah, but just got to be careful because we can't we yeah we can't change the material every six months either because then you know. People, clients lose confidence in you. Then you know it's kind of like we can't, you know. So it's it's really it is really difficult to do, and it's a real uh, you know risky risky move. It's actually a fantastic segue because I think Mark kind of was touching on this as well. Um, you know, we're talking about how we use LCA tools to really measure our impacts, um, and I think Mark, you touched on it. There's a gap in data out there, right? Like. You can be required to do an LCI in your building, and you may have a handful of materials that have an actual EPD on it, right? So, um, I'm just really this question. It's it kind of mentions more about like how important are these databases, like Tracy and CML. You know, for the people who maybe aren't aware, Tracy is a U.S. approved database of how we measure EPDs, and CML is the European version, but they're most of the time exactly the same uh, calculation way there for for a133 GWP but do these databases do you think um, I know a lot of people when they're starting to do LCAs these databases really confuse them and it maybe hinders their growth or a progression to do an LCA because they're worried about having the accurate EPD for every single material so um, just wondering how does that work how do you guys use that in your decision making do you use the exact material you're specking on everything or do you guys feel comfortable using the generics or the regional averages um, how do you guys address that and we'll start maybe on the design side and then because i know mark you have a slightly different um approach on it but let's start with maybe liam on this one and just you know how how do you navigate the database and all the ep information out there um a little bit controversial here. I'm not a big fan of a lot of the databases uh, and a lot of the information. Um, my biggest issue is that, that it's EPDs in themselves are quite hard to read, uh, at even a glance. Um, the second part of that is that they do tell a picture, but they're only a small picture of the material. Um, one of the biggest issues I found, we, we've been using one click um, here. Uh, which has been it's been fantastic as a library, um, but when you're at that level of doing an LCA, you you want kind of strict numbers. You want to know exactly where you are at the later stages. And I've I've seen a few few products where they've got an embodied carbon number and it's plus or minus twenty five thirty percent. Um, and if you're timesing that over a building, you're talking about plus or minus tens, if not hundreds of tons. Sometimes that, as much as it might be lots of numbers and digit. Di uh, small decimal points and things it's not that clear still so um what we do find is that we're trying to get averages we're trying to get ranges the biggest thing that we're finding with this is getting the data from lcas from those and averaging them out to see what the upper and lower bounds what the average is and when we're looking at say material choices for some sort of cladding we can see that aluminium is in this range that copper is in this range and we can make a decision based on that rather than here is an exact number which isn't actually exact and we're going to stick to this forever um so it's yeah it's being precisely imprecise with it and understanding where the limits are with the uh epds and information you're given no it's great precisely imprecise right because you're you're kind of not guessing in the beginning right but you're filling in a lot of blanks yeah to make those kind of informed decisions and really as the design evolves, I think, you know, people like Mark will narrow down that and actually report what is actually being procured, you know, with their yeah. little process. It's so. it's going from a kind of uh, an estimated range of this. And as you're going through mm -hmm. the stages, it's whittling it down till you get to the point where you find a product and you know it's, well, as much as you can, you know it's within this. But you don't want to kind of start with a number here and then it 
is jumping around, you want to know what that range is and whether it's higher or lower within that range, that's fine. But as long as you yes. know what that range is and you're not giving a number and they're not meeting that target and suddenly whoop, everyone's unhappy. Yeah. No, that's, that's a great point. Um, and, you know, actually, Brandon, I'm going to bring you in here because we kind of went with a different approach when we worked with you. We started with your specifications and we, with things that we knew were going to be specified, we kind of narrowed those down early as possible. And then for the unknowns, I believe we kind of left that more generic. Is that, did you feel that was something um, that, helped, that was helpful in when addressing this kind of issue, Brandon? Or do you guys, did you guys, you know, alter that? Or how, how are you guys approaching this? Yeah, so I think that that was really helpful in that we could be specific with the data that we had and we knew it was accurate and had already been implemented. So that's like low hanging fruit almost. Um, so building that in and being accurate where we can can help kind of like take that, you know, wide statistical boundary and kind of narrow it a little bit. Um, generally speaking, though, we're talking about, you know, the, the places where we're going to have the most impact now, because this is still a relatively new process for us as a firm, only in the past couple of years. And given the length of projects, it's, you know, we're, we're only halfway through one project that started since then. They take four or five years to complete. Um, so we're really trying to make decisions where the kind of minutia of like differences between EPDs really doesn't matter that much. We're talking like, is the, the difference between like a concrete building and a cat, like a CLT building, right? Like those are huge numbers, um, you know, on the factors of like millions of kilograms of CO2 for the entire building. Um, so it's more beneficial for us to kind of try to move more quickly with a more generalist approach for the most part um, and try and target the places where we can have the biggest impacts on like a millions of kilograms scale. Um, and then as the project progresses, we can start to get more focused and kind of tighten down on the, on the specifics of each individual product and like where it's coming from and, and the kind of the nuances of each of those EPDs. Um, yeah, so really no daylight between Liam and I on the approach, I think. Um, really disclosure and data collection um, and kind of making those big decisions is the priority for us now. Perfect. Now that's, that's what I was hopefully getting at. And I was hopefully kind of a baited yeah. question there, but I wanted to make sure, you know, so would you guys say to the people in the audience, maybe you get kind of hesitant or like struggling through these LCAs, like take a stab at it, go with what you, you know, it's okay to, you know, maybe pick the wrong JIP. You're not going to be too wrong, right? Just get a number at right. first. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the PACI process that we worked with has been really helpful in that in that way, just to pitch that, um, because we have something that's just built right into our models. We talk about this a lot, making sure that the designers, the ones who aren't like deep in the technical knowledge and know-how of reading APDs and doing LCA, um, they're just working with the material and they have the data just in the model already. So it's very easy for us to evaluate um, big picture decisions like that um, without much, much, um, like much barrier to entry there. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah, no, that's that's right. I'd say just to jump in very quickly. Um, there is the ICE database, um, which is literally just a spreadsheet which has loads of different materials and tells you what their average embodied carbon number is. Absolutely, the simplest way to get in. You can compare, as Brandon said, aluminium to copper to CLT to concrete. It gives you a number. Um, it'd be nice to have a range, but. At the very start, it helps you kind of get in and then you can refine it later on. So I see your database me yeah. three now. Um go for that and for anyone that's worrying. Absolutely. Great suggestion. And uh Mark, this is where we kind of get into you have a little bit more control over your projects, right? <clears throat> Trying to build aspect. Um yeah. how are you approaching this? Do you guys start wider since you have control of your specs from the beginning? Or are you trying to narrow it down from day one? How how are you guys going to what we've done is we're, we're, we're trying to pull in together a minute. We've kind of got probably three or four different systems that we use for modular in our kind of modular game that we do what we build three or two or three, sorry, four certified systems. So we've got a way there working with you guys, how we did there to get the kind of a, a, a standard build up for us walls and a module, the size of a module so that we can from early stages get, like you say, that kind of that figure to, to give to a client to say that, you know, that if you build this way, this is what you're looking like. If you're building this way, it's slightly better. If you're building this way, it's slightly better again. And giving that option range at the beginning, just, you know, but I like to say our problem is if we start introducing new materials into this, we need to look at uh, fire testing, et cetera. So we're trying to get these kind of ranges now where we've got a standard product that we've been building with now for the last kind of four years. And we know what that 
performs like. We know what that kind of LCA looks like, and for that, for that build up and that project and a couple of projects that we've got, and now we're trying to better that so that we can offer a, you know the the the, the better product there for the um you know for giving giving a much better product for the customer. Obviously, it's just is finding those products and putting it into there but we have got a simple way of doing it at the minute to give uh, figures at the beginning of a project similar to what we did there like say for that uh, you know project that we looked at you know we looked at it on uh, kind of a bigger scale to get the simple figures to start with no, absolutely and that's like a great approach it's slightly different but you have more control so we're we're gonna find that as much as possible but mark you guys are leveraging something that actually brandon helped us come up with when we were talking about you know uh, the baseline design versus progressive versus yep. a green design, right? And so now you have a, a standard module and you have a, a green progressive module and then you have a green module that you can show clients like, hey, you can get good, better, best. So yeah, I think that's important and I provide that range and opportunity because we all know cost is a, a huge factor. All right. Um, all right, so let's focus on collaboration, right? Uh, you all kind of spoke about stakeholders, you spoke about engineers, you spoke about, you know, the contractors, you spoke about supply chain as well. Collaboration drives sustainability success, right? It brings together des- the designers, the engineers, the contractors, the sustainability experts are essential as well. But equally important is how we track and how we communicate the impact of these efforts together on those projects. I'm just kind of curious with the just the last couple of minutes, like how does collaboration help all of you guys in reaching your sustainability goals? And how do you measure and share these successes with the, with the other stakeholders on the projects? Um, maybe we'll start with Mark this time. Uh, yeah, look, collaboration for us, obviously, because we've, we're have we designing it, we're building it, we're, we're you know, we've got the whole thing. So kind of, you know, our team here of, uh, you know, they're employed by CPAS, so collaboration, you know, we're all working together we're in the same building. We kind of, you know, we're constantly in contact. So, you know, that collaboration from us is something that we're moving into now for the sustainability goals. Obviously, collaboration up until probably, you know, six months a year ago was basically, it was about getting the project completed, getting it on time, getting it on budget. That's the collaboration side. Now, like you say, there's another pillar now, which is the sustainability one that we've got to collaborate on. And, you know, we're looking at how much, uh, you know, waste is being brought up on site and how we can eliminate that. We're looking at products. We're looking at, you know, the, the, the structural side of it with the structural engineer, how we can, you know, refine that. And we're trying to pull everybody in to give everybody a bit of a, you know, bit of a chance to kind of influence on this and, you know, push it forward because, you know, the last thing that anybody wants when any other jobs is, you know, being told this is what we're doing. That's it. You know, we've got to try and bring everyone along, including the client including the engineers uh, on their side and you know try and explain it in a way that everybody understands you know what kind of the, kind of the goals are uh, for, for the project uh, and they do vary to be honest like I say because you know ultimately cost comes into it a lot of the times for us on projects where you know the, the guys are really keen to do all this but then the cost is the, the, the stumbling block where you know they might roll back slightly on certain elements and uh, I see Luke laughing there because it's, it's so frustrating for us because you know we can put months and months into some of these projects where they're looking you know amazing the green you know etc and then the cost thing comes in and it's you know no good anymore we're going to go we're back with a traditional way that has been done always so you know that's our biggest challenge yeah so um, that push and that pull right is trying to yeah. get that vision out there <laughs> and then pull everyone yeah. with that um not always easy not always easy just very quickly like uh liam do you have like how, how does it how is it for you uh it's it's essential. I think it's absolutely impossible um, from the architecture side without every stakeholder being invested. Um, in terms of embodied carbon, 50% of it is the structure. Another 20% is just all the ducting and MEP services. Um, and then you then bring in operational. That's, again, that's MEP. Um, without them, we're, we're making such a tiny impact uh, mm. in the grand scheme of every building that Without them setting targets, making sure we're keeping them to the targets, they're keeping us to the targets, um, and then sharing in the success with them, uh, it it can't happen. Basically, uh, holding accountability as well. Yes. Yeah. So. yeah. <laughs> um, and very last, uh, Brendan. Yeah, I'll be brief. Um, on top of everything Mark and, and Liam just said, um, I think we find ourselves obviously collaboration is essential. Um, but uh, we found ourselves kind of in the role of an educator more often than not these days. Um, I think everybody that we work with, because we most often have like an integrated design process, with, so the GC and the and everything is all um, onboarded very early. 
everybody wants to do the thing that's best and most sustainable. Um, you know, we've never been combative in that sense. Um, but often, as I mentioned earlier, really that kind of stops at operational carbon and people don't really know how to talk about embodied carbon and what the impact is um, on the building and then on, the, on the environment in that aspect. So we spend a lot of time developing ways to speak with people about embodied carbon, not in a belittling way, but in a way that we can bring everybody up, like let everyone buy their bootstraps so that we're all on the same page and having the same conversation. Um, and then finding ways to like graphical ways to actually kind of communicate um, the benefits of using low embodied carbon materials. Um, we're doing LCA and the kind of improvements we can make in ways that's really easily digestible, very easily communicative, um, and allows people with all different backgrounds and kind of knowledge about the subject matter to uh, to absorb easily. Yeah, education is always key, right? Um, I, I, what I've kind of like heard, which is great, is, you know, Liam, you're based here in the UK. Brendan, you're based in the US. Uh, Mark, you're based in Ireland, right? And often I always kind of hear that, hey, so, uh, for us, it's so different. This is what we need to do, X, Y, Z, for our particular country or our region or anything. But throughout today's kind of conversation, there's been similar, similar goals, similar sort of approaches with a slight sort of variance and everything. And it's almost, again, the collaboration, we talk about it, but if we actually kind of come together, be a lot more transparent as we are doing today as well, then actually those sort of um, those stepping stones will perhaps be a little bit more easier. But that's brought me some reassurance that actually we're not so different when it comes to sustainability and reducing our impact that we can actually do as well. And lastly, what I will say is that we do have our second part of our series as well. It'll be great for you guys to kind of join us on to that. So thank you, everyone. 